Welcome to the Boone Podcast. I'm your host, Brett Boone, and today on the program, I sit down with a longtime big league scout, currently special advisor for the Oakland A's. He signed some of the biggest players in MLB. You probably know him from the movie Moneyball. You know the name from the movie Moneyball. Ladies and gentlemen, the real Grady Fuson. Grady, thanks for coming on the program. <laughs> nice entry. I like it. Um, I'll tell you, and, and, and I'm being honest here. There's not a lot of guys, you know, for those of you listening to the Boone podcast, uh, Grady and myself worked together. Grady's been working on that side of the ledger for a lot of years. I worked with the Oakland A's briefly. Uh, I believe it was 2014 and 15. There's not a lot of guys and Grady will, will back me up on that, that Brett Boone thinks could teach him about the game of baseball or any intricacy of the game of baseball. This guy actually, Grady Fuson taught me some things. I got admitted. I hate to admit it, but I do. Uh, it's killing you. It was great. It was great. It was. It was another aspect of my life, uh, something outside the box, something I'd never done before, and uh, it was a lot of fun. But, Grady, you taught me some things. Well, I'm glad. That was a tough call. You were a stubborn client. And, and I remember when we first <laughs> met, we, we first met, you You would look at me. You're kind of sizing me up like, all right, what does this guy know? What, you know? what's how's is, how's is brett going to be in this arena you know helping young kids uh mostly i did a lot of my work with the young a ball guys we had a great group at the at the time uh olsen with the atlanta braves comes to mind matt chapman is the third yeah. baseman uh with the toronto blue jays but we had a good group back then and i remember you told me you said booney what do you think you 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 test me you just ask me questions not that you necessarily wanted to hear my answer, but how I answered the question. And you said, you're a quick read. A lot of you guys are like that. You come on the scouting scene and you just think, oh, I know if he's a big leaguer in two minutes. Explain a little bit what you meant by 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 little things like that. Well, I just, I just think as you grow in the game, whether it's player development or scouting, and <clears throat> we, we're all opinion-oriented type people, but the game of baseball is, is so difficult. It's, it's unjudging. It's, uh, it's hard to take great tools and turn them into great players. Um, it's hard to make great players without good tools. And sometimes those things don't collide on time. And even the sharpest looking player in the world can have, you know, mental issues, uh, competitive issues, emotional issues uh, that hinder them, you know, reaching their potential. At the same time, we've all seen the marginally skilled player that has so much passion, so much interest, so much work ethic that makes himself uh, a decent big leaguer. So it, it comes and goes in a lot of different ways. And sometimes patience, I mean, we're always evaluating, but patience as far as making that ultimate call, I think just takes some time. Uh, I remember the question, and, and I still refer to this today in baseball, you know, when I'm having baseball conversations and, and the topic of scouting comes up. And this was a real moment for me. I remember we were talking about a player, and this is one of the questions I'm talking about. You said, Booney, who's that guy remind you of? And I kind of looked at you like, what the hell is this guy asking me who he reminds me of? I don't know, Grady. What does it matter who he reminds me of? And you said, because if he doesn't remind you of any big leaguer, he's probably not a big leaguer. That was a moment for me where I went, wow, that's a great point. Because yeah. if you haven't seen it out there, he's either a unicorn or he's not a big leaguer. And, and I thought that was, that was one of the things I talk about I learned from you. That was a moment where I just went, that's a great point. What am I thinking? <laughs> you know, I, I got to learn a little bit more about scouting. Well, you know, when you go sit in a big league ballpark for as many years as I have, they look different. Yeah. Uh, they look different than AAA. They look different than AA. And they different, definitely look different than A-ball guys. So in our case, I actually, me and you went together a bunch of college games prior to the draft. And that's, you know, that's the amateur level. So that's, you know, they just look different. They act different uh, in the big leagues. And there's so many different facets to scouting. I want to cover a few of them with you today. You know, there's that ultimate decision making on draft day. There's evaluating uh, big league players for a trade. I mean, there's so many different things that I that I want to get to. 
Uh, but first, before we get into the scouting aspect, uh, I've had a bunch of guys on the on the podcast from those Moneyball years. Chobby was on, uh, Zito, Giambi, David Justice, uh, Johnny Damon on. I asked them all the same question. I'm going to ask you this. How accurate did Moneyball portray the real story? Uh, very little. I, I know that, that uh, Billy Bean played uh, – uh, Brad Pitt played Billy Bean, so it wasn't that realistic. I know Billy loved that. Uh, you were played by a, a guy by the name of Metlock. Ken it, Metlock. Give me the give me the pros and the or, or not the pros and the cons. But give me the semi truths or the stuff that wasn't true at all. Because I thought it was a great movie. I thought it was well done, but that's Hollywood. Yeah, I think the biggest truth is that there were a couple of players um, on that club and even traded for. That uh, that Billy basically went off analytics. You know, a lot of on base, a lot of slug, uh, you know, whiff rates, things like that. They were evident in the game. But the mistruth is when you look at that club and how that was built. That club was, you know, it was built around Zito, Mulder, Huddy, Shavi, Ramon Hernandez. I mean, the, the the list goes on about kids that. You know, we drafted, signed, and developed in the system that became the core of that team. There was no Coke machine in the clubhouse that you had to pay yeah, for. That was the big question. Uh, <laughs> uh, Ron Washington and Billy did not go up to Hatterberg's house in Seattle. He was never told playing first base is easy. <laughs> um, it, was the rent winning streak real? Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of things I would miss because that was the year I left and went to Texas as the assistant GM. But, um, you know, I, I think when you sat back and you looked at the movie as a uh, entertainment piece, I think I thought it was done pretty good. You know what? A lot of people, I think I told you, originally there were a few of us that were going to play our own part with a different director. So Steve Soderbergh, who did Ocean's Eleven and um, a couple other big things, he was the original director. And Paul D. Podesto, who played the analytic guy, uh, or was supposed to in the movie, uh, had a bunch of issues day in and day out about how he was going to be presented in the movie. So that's why he was the only guy that wasn't going to play his part. And apparently Sony just got so tired of it. The day they went to film, uh, day one in Phoenix, they canceled and shot the movie down. And the movie went into a trash bin and Brad Pitt bought it a year and a half later for, I, I understood, 10 million bucks. He wanted to do it that bad. New director. I think his name was Bennett Miller, Emmett Miller, Bennett Miller. And uh, he's a guy that doesn't use real characters in his productions. So. <clears throat> everything went a different path. Were you involved at all? Did they ask, did, did they come to you and interview you and say, Hey, we want to be as realistic as we can, or were you kept out of it? I was pretty much kept out of it. I mean, Ken Medlock called me uh, once or twice. and There wasn't much to it. You could tell this guy had played enough uh, baseball or something where he had some answers to everything already. So yeah. I didn't really have much to do with it. Hollywood guys, it's fun. Yeah. I've, um, all right, I want to talk about the draft. My, I, I remember my draft story. I remember Kenny Compton. I'm sure you know, remember him. Sure. Uh, my Seattle, Seattle scout, who I tell to this day the greatest scout that ever lived, and and Kenny likes that and he laughs about it. But everybody has a draft story. Uh, you know, I got drafted late out of high school. I got drafted lower than I thought I should have been drafted out of college. In the end, it all didn't matter. Um, but let's talk about that time we, we did work together and it was my first, <clears throat> my first, uh, taste of scouting because, because I was, we were, we were both working for the, for the Oakland A's. Uh, I was working with the kids at the lower levels. And, and I remember he said, Booney's going to go to the SEC tournament and kind of get my first introduction to scouting what it's like. I, I remember <laughs> Grady would say to me, all right, Booney, keep your eye on, see what you see this. And I'm coming to you with freshmen and sophomores and saying, Grady, I really like that guy. And you're like, Booney, 
He's a freaking sophomore. We're not here for that. We're here for the draft coming up in a week. Um, grandpa was a scout forever. My yeah. grandfather with the Boston Red Sox last 40 years of his, of his life. And he would, you know, try to give me the ins and outs. But, you know, as a player at that time, you don't want to hear from Gramps. You just look at Gramps and he tells you about this kid. And I'll say, yeah, Gramps, you don't know what you're doing. How tough, how tough, <laughs> how tough could scouting be, you know? And he would just kind of look at me like, oh, Brett, you, you don't know anything. And and really, you don't. You think you do, but you don't. Um, that was a big learning process for me. I got to sit down with some guys that have like yourself that had done it for a long time, <clears throat> guys that necessarily didn't play the game for a long time, but have been at this for a long time. I remember little things. I, I forget the gentleman I was sitting with, but he said, Booney, you got to sit here and be patient and you got to watch. And then you got to come back and you got to watch again. Well, not necessarily in my case, I was just there for right before the draft, but he says throughout the course of this, of the year leading up to the draft, he said, I've seen this guy 20 times and I look for this, 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 and this, and it was kind of a tutelage for me. It was kind of, it was kind of cool. Um, the process behind of it. Cause it, like I said, completely different entity, completely different uh, subject matter than anything I've dealt with in my baseball life to that point. Um, but let's just break it down. Basic. When did, when does a scout, when does a scout start looking at kids? And I'm talking about uh, area scouts. That was your first job in 1982. You were an area scout for the, yeah. for the Oakland A's. Let's break it down to the basics of the people listening to the boom podcast. When do you start looking at kids? Well, in, in today's game, there's so many things going on in the summer prior to their senior year. So you have all these showcases throughout the country uh, that involve uh, kids that are going to go into their senior year. Most of them have been seen before because along the, the trails as an area scout, uh, you go in to see Brett Boone at USC and by chance, you see a sophomore shortstop uh, that's going to be eligible next year, and you start, and you like him, and you start taking notes. So it kind of starts like that, and then the closer you get into your senior year, um, you know, you have things during the winter, uh, and then boom, the spring starts, and here we go. But most of it in today's game is that summer. Uh, before your senior year. Now, back in your day, and certainly in my day, there wasn't anything. There wasn't anything like this. There wasn't all these showcases throughout the country: East Coast Showcase, West Coast Showcase, Midwest. I mean, our area scouts are leaving the draft after six months of work, and they get about a week at home before they start hitting all these showcases. We didn't have that when we were coming through the game you know you might have played on a legion team or something like that and got exposed that way but you weren't able to ever find anything where you could put yourself um, in the middle of all these other talented young kids uh you know they're they're going into their senior year same with college you know you got the cape uh you used to have alaska you got the northwoods league where all these freshmen and sophomores go to play in college so that's where it starts it is. You, you talk about it being a lot different in, in our day, without a doubt. You know, I played in, in Southern California and, and Long Beach at the time. The big league were all the best players in, in Southern Cal, which is which is kind of a hotbed, was uh, Connie Mack. And you played at old Long Beach Stadium. And uh, that's what we did in the summer. We didn't have showcases and we're going here and there. It's it's I, I don't know if it's necessarily that much better of a thing the way the game is now, but it is what it is. Um, you mentioned Alaska. You mentioned Cape Cod for college players uh, in 1990. You, pr you pretty much had two options. You go to Cape Cod, you play with a wood bat, you go to the Alaska League, which has been going forever. My father played in, in Fairbanks. Sure. Uh, now Alaska's still going, but it but it's not prominent like it used to be. No, Cape Cod, no, no. Cape Cod's still the, the top top rung, I think, for college players. Correct me if I'm wrong. But the thing I find that that is positive about today's game is there are a lot more options for college players than there used to be. It, it seemed like when I was at USC, 
only the elite players got to play summer ball and you went to Alaska and Cape Cod. And if you didn't fit the, if you weren't one of the best players, you were really kind of, what are you going to do this summer? You're going to the beach. Now it seems like there's a lot more options for kids that aren't necessarily that, that top prospect. No, you're totally right. There's, there's leagues all over the country now that are uh, you, you, using college freshmen and sophomores to, to be on their teams and, you know, get some exposure. Now, as a scout, the scouts are still going to where the biggest group of talented players are. So like the Cape, right? You could go into the Cape for a week and put your eyes on 50 guys are going to go in the top 10, 12 rounds of the draft. When did you make contact with a kid you were in? I remember just, and, and this is all kind of, it was a long time ago, but in high school, I kind of knew who the scouts were. You know, I knew, oh, that's that guy's with the Yankees. He'd make small talk with me. Hey, Booney, how you doing today? And you start, as as players, you start to know who the guys are. If Grady Fuson's in my, my t- ah, he's with the A's. I know I know Grady. Uh, do, you, do you strike up conversation with any any of the kids when you're scouting them just have that relationship in case one day I do draft him or do you kind of just stay in the background? Yeah. I I tried to get to know every player that was at least on my draft list or thinking about being on my draft list, whether that was meeting them prior to a game, after a game, talking to some parents, talking to their parents, talking to a coach, trying to get as much information and feel about their situation as I could. Now, the one thing that hindered me a little bit was I didn't get the summer to pre-work any of this because I always managed and coached our rookie teams in the summer. So when I got back after the season, it was my fall was my big part of year. And, and when you talk about, when you talked about how important, uh, the intangibles are with a player. I always thought that was really important. And I remember when I first came to the A's, I talked to you about that. I said, it would, it's so important to know what this kid's made of. We can all sit there and say, okay, he's got a, he's got a seven arm and he's got, you know, here's his speed and he's his bat speed and, and all the tools that you use to, to pretty much evaluate a player, but that unknown, does this guy really believe he's as good as we know he is? Or like you mentioned in the opening guys that fly under the radar that don't just shoot out to you because they're overwhelmingly talented, but they have that intangible that makes them a big leaguer one day. You know, you you have certain guys that come to mind for me in my playing day. That's a guy like Eckstein with the, with the Anaheim angels. He probably didn't, didn't grade out the, the highest, but the intangibles that he had made him. And for me, was one of the keys to that 2002 Angels season was Eckstein at shortstop. That guy, sure. He, he sure. made him. He made them go. You know, runner on third, less than two, Grady, in the early 2000s, playing the Angels with all those stars they had. I'll tell you what, I don't want Eckstein at the plate because huh. that sucker's going to get the job done. He's going to hook those, a ground ball right down the third baseline and beat you. Or he's going to hit a home run for him, which would be a, a sack fly to the warning track. But you're not going to strike him out, and he's he's just going to get the job done. Those are things that aren't talked about enough. Um, no, because, this, you know, in today's game, they can't measure it. So with, with the influx of analytics everywhere, the only thing that works with analytics is what they can measure. If they can't measure it, then it just becomes a theory. So when you think about how the game has changed with the amount of agents and and uh, how these kids are kind of sheltered from professional baseball people at times, uh, they're scripted. You try to talk to a player and you can tell he's been scripted by his agent what to say, what not to say. So it's harder and harder and harder to get a read uh, on a player just by t- talking to them and, and doing the things sometimes we used to do versus watching this guy play the game over and over again, see where the instincts are, see where the feel for the game is, see the passion level, the energy level, and continue to maneuver your way around people around him that have coached him as parents, 
whatever it may be, and pick and choose your your questions to ask and see if you can get ahead that way. But so many of these kids are sheltered. There's colleges out there that will not let you talk to a player. Um, there's agents out there that just script everything a player and his family is going to tell you. So it becomes very difficult for for our area guys who do the most of this. You know, as a cross checker, are you doing what you did with me? We're in and out, right? We're flying in. We're driving to the ballpark. We're looking at 10 kids in the SEC tournament. We're getting on a plane and we're going elsewhere. It wasn't necessarily our jobs to figure out, you know, the X's and O's about what makes this player tick. But after you've done it for a while, there's a lot of giveaways by just watching a player play the game and how players react around him. Isn't it amazing, too, that that you you talk about players being scripted and them coming to you, you know, if you're going to have a conversation with them for 10 minutes and he gives you all the answers that his agent give, you're like, who the hell do you think, who the, who the hell you think you're talking to? Are you serious? Are you serious kid? You think this is benefiting you? Yeah. Fly to Nashville and interview all these Vanderbilt guys up in the press box. You get five minutes per player and you're just kind of going, all right, what am I getting out of this besides looking him straight in the face? Right. This is this is this is for a they're they're interviewing for a movie. Yeah. Uh, all right, talk about the scale a little bit. Uh, the the one to eight and two to two to eight. Or two to eight. And the thing that always confused me, still does, uh, because everybody has a different style when they're rating a player. They have a, a current rating and a future. Uh, and a lot of scouts put it in. Future six for argument's sake, which is a little bit above big league average, but they'll say now he's a four hitter. Well, I laugh because you may have this big prospect in high school and they'll say current four future seven. And I'm going, wait a minute, current four. If we put him in the big leagues, he's a four. No, if we put him in the big leagues right now, he's a two, Two. but, but, but it's really, you know, there's no, it's so subjective. Just let the guys in on, let, let the guys in on uh, listening to the show right now uh, a little bit into that world and how you come up with your numbers. And why is it at, why is it at two to 10? Why is it two to eight? You know, I don't know who created it. I think it was old Branch Ricky that put this thing <laughs> on the map years ago. But the grading scale is, is, is for most clubs is two to eight or 20 to 80. There are half of the clubs out there that use a middle grade, like you mentioned, a a four hitter. Well, you could make him a 45 hitter. Uh, back in my day, I never changed that because I wanted guys to make a decision. Is he a four or is he a five? Don't hinder in between, but everybody's a little different. So obviously an eight, if you're talking about a major league hitter, is a guy that's hitting 310, 315 or above. If you're talking about power, you're talking about a guy that hits 30 bombs or above. Um, so you have all these, and then from there you, you, you go with some numbers. So, uh, running speed down the line four two from the left side is average four three from the right side is average. And you just work yourself up and down that scale. Uh, you have arm grades that you grade. What, what's a forearm? What's a five arm? What's a six arm? Um, so, you, you know, you have all these skills with pitchers. It's, it's it's fastball uh, velocity. It's it's off speed. It's slider, curveball. Uh, if if a guy's got a two seamer and a sinker, it's not really graded. But you mentioned that in your report. Uh, obviously, change up and command. So those are those are the big things that are getting graded, along with some intangible things like you know arm action, delivery, aggressiveness, uh, instincts. All those things are, they don't really go into the uh, the overall OFP number, overall future potential. But when you're when you're dealing with younger players that have not achieved big league uh, life yet, there's always projection. You know, when you look at a young college hitter coming out of college and he looks hitterish, and you think this guy's got a chance to be a 260, 270 hitter. Um, obviously, if you put him in the big leagues now, he's not going to do that. 
But after two, three, maybe four years in the minor leagues of development, training, work, uh, trial and error, here he comes. Um, and all of a sudden you see that uh, situation where he did. He became a six hitter in the big leagues. How heavily do you weigh on the intangibles personally? I know it probably fluctuates from scout to scout, uh, organization to organization. Some probably consider that uh, they have they more heavily weigh it. Some don't. You personally, the intangibles. I think it means a lot. I think character, makeup, these intangibles that you're talking about are 60, 70 percent of the battle. I'm very careful on which one of our scouts or player development people I trust when they relay information to me. Um, at the same time, when you work in player development like I do now, I can figure out a player's character, his makeup, his want to, his emotional setup, uh, probably within a week or two and much quicker than scouts can when they're out there seeing them, you know, once a month. Um, it's, 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 it doesn't mean that people don't change along the way, that they improve their attitudes and makeups. And, uh, but there's a lot of people that just get stuck um, with bad habits and attitudes and mental skills that they can't get over. Um, but, I mean, it's the heart of the player, the intangibles. Right. We can right. all find, we can all find tools, right? Uh, you know, maybe not eights across the board, but we can all find tools. It's the heart of the player, which is all this stuff you're talking about that really will be the determining factor. And I think, you know, with obviously the limited time I spent on, on your side of the ledger, but the majority of, of my life was spent on the field as a player, uh, I agree with you wholeheartedly because I played with so many guys. I played with so many guys at the minor league level. I played with guy a lot of, you know, a, a ton of guys at the big league level. I played with great players. I played with mediocre players. I played with players that I'm impressed that they're having a career in the big leagues because of their intangibles. So I really, I understand how, how important that is, especially at the big league level, because you, you, how many times you see a guy you play with in triple a and then, Five years later, I'm going, man, I thought that guy was going to make it. You know, ability-wise, he had all the ability. Gets to the big leagues, it's a different ball game. That 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 stadium gets real big on him. Yeah. You know, and lights, lights get brighter, pressure gets bigger. And and there's no rhyme or reason to it. Yeah. You know, some guys just aren't cut out for the big stage. They get to the big leagues, and that doesn't look like the guy you've been scouting in in, in the PCL. He's just he gets there and it's a different world. It's I, I don't know. I try to liken it to to play in your local pub and then go into Carnegie hall. You know, it's yeah, like, it's, it's different. It's different. You know, I, well, even that, for me, go ahead. That's what, that's what separates good player development uh, coaches and systems are, are coaches that can take these players from the day they're drafted and continue to work on all these intangible things that, you know, become evident in the big leagues. And even prior to just getting there, I could be sitting in AAA and having a career year. I still don't have it all figured out until I get there and face the music. Without a but doubt. But they, they, they have to have the skills uh, to handle the ups and downs, the travel, the work, the pressure, the bright lights, um, everything that goes with playing in the big leagues. And, and I laugh, Grady, because when I was coming up, or, or I get asked this all the time when, when doing an interview. It's, uh, well, it was different for you. It must not have been a big deal because you grew up the way you did. You grew up in big league clubhouses. And I laugh at them and I said, listen, growing up as a little kid, being a pain in the ass, pestering my dad's teammates, that's one thing. I said, but putting on a uniform and that being your job and going out on a big league field, that's a big deal for me too. And it was as a young player. Now, I, I don't know how much living the life I did as a kid helped me, but I know this, it didn't hurt me one bit, but I would like everybody else. I remember my first day in the big leagues and it was Baltimore. You know, I'm playing in Calgary, Canada. I'm killing it in triple a, I get the call. I go to the big leagues. And when I stepped in that big league box as a player for the first time, it is different. 
I, I can't explain it to people. You've got to go through it. It's, it's the space is way bigger. The decks are way higher and it's just a different, uh, stage. It's not, it's completely different than being in a triple a batter's box. And until you go through it, it's like, I can't explain it to you. Everybody's got to go through it and, and find their way. That's why it's everybody's dream. Yeah. So how do I You're make right. my dreams come true? You're right. Um, we're coming up on the draft here soon, about nine days away. Uh, I've never been in the war room. I've been on the phone chipping in. Nobody ever listened to me <clears> anyway when, when we came down to the pick. <laughs> but uh, take me just briefly inside the war room what we call it. Uh, Grady's for those of you listening to the Boone podcast, Grady's about to go to, up to Oakland and, and start preparing for the draft. And uh, you were telling me off air, every, every, each club goes to their city for the draft. The main draft is ra- is ran out of uh, New York. I'm going to be at the MLB studios at the all-star game. I'll be chipping in my two cents, you know, uh, not knowing anything about this year's draft or the players, but take take uh, take us briefly through that war room, that lead up to the draft, the conversations <laughs> behind the scenes, who's involved, uh, just your brief scenario of it. Uh, well, in our case here in Oakland, and I've kind of done it wherever I was in Texas for a few years and San Diego for five. I like to engage our entire scouting staff in the draft, so I've had basically everybody there. But I start the first three or four days with just the cross checkers, the guys that have gone around and seen, you know, the better players in the country. And we start talking about the top six. So in most drafts, you can get through three, four, possible five rounds in 60 players because teams just tend to see things different the deeper into the draft you go. So we sit around the room, we look at video, we look at numbers, uh, we listen to the scouts talk, uh, your report versus my report, and collectively come up with a slot up on that board that we're currently going to put you. So, you know, Brett Boone, you're going to slide into third in our first column or whatever it may be. And you just work your, you just work your way through this. Now, when it's all said and done, you're going to have boards filled with four to 500 players. I mean, it's mayhem, but it's that top 60 to 75 uh, that you're going to work off of once the draft starts uh, to get you through five, six, seven rounds. They say to you, it's go time. Oakland's on the clock. Prepared. Is that decisions already made? Done? Yes. We're, yeah, we're, I mean, we, we've got these players ranked in the order in which we would take them. Most of the discussion about a player has already been done, satisfied. This is how we like them. We like Brett over Grady. So if Brett's there, we're taking him. If Brett's gone, we're going to Grady. It's uh, very seldom are you going to last-minute flip and go to another column to pull a player out unless something crazy just happened. And when you're talking today and you mentioned slots, much different now than it was when I was coming out in 1990. Oh, yeah. uh, today, there, there is a slot and a, and a money amount in each, uh, each position in the draft. Now, Correct. that can fluctuate. You may be able to save money here, add money here. The guy in the third round might be getting a lot more more money than his slot, but that was kind of worked out before everything went down. That that draft pick's made. What happened next? Who calls him? Who talks to him? When does that process start? How quick does it start? That first uh, day, first round pick. You know, yeah, the area guy is usually the first guy to call him. He leaves the room, gives him a call, lets him know today's. In today's world, every player is watching the draft on MLB, at least the first two rounds. Um, you know, so it's cool to be able to have our TVs on and watch the families and everybody, you know, raise holy hell and have a good time. Um, at some point, uh, in most cases, the GM will call that first rounder at some point in that day. Uh, but other than that, most of it's all the area scout. 
Has it gotten easier or tougher from a negotiation standpoint so from, say, we'll just use my generation as as the comp. Uh, 1990, you're drafting uh, pick somebody in the second round uh, versus 2023, you're, you're drafting X person in the second round. Is it easier now to know, all right, this is going to be a sign versus back then because back then the money wasn't the same so you had to compete with that with that Stanford full ride nowadays a little different in the first round second round third round we we just had Jay Johnson who just uh the LSU head coach that won the World Series we just had him on talking about the college game and how different it is now to recruit because if you're drafting the first round out of high school second round out of high school third round out of high school, you're not getting that guy coming to college whereas right. in my day Hey, that that Stanford scholarship matches up pretty good with the cash that say the Oakland A's are offering. The 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 challenges of 2023 versus 1990, uh, the pros and the cons of the two different eras. Okay, so back in your day, it was uh, you know the area guy was checking in on you. Are you ready for the draft? Are you prepared? Uh, where do you where do you think you're going to go in this draft? You would ask questions like, are you signable through the top five rounds? If not, what would be the holdup? Um, in today's game, these things are all worked out prior to picking the player. And it's usually done between the GM and or the scouting director. Sometimes a cross checker might get involved. But, you know, we're checking with four or five guys uh, with their agents, maybe a little bit with the family or the player but mostly with their representatives. Uh, you know, if this player is available in the third round, can we get him done for our slot? And, you know, there's games being played out there. There's guys that just outbid themselves because somebody invents, well, I have a club that's offered 400 and your slot's only 325. So if he does get to you, uh, I would prefer that you pass. Yeah, you know, a lot of games being played, but we would be better off if we stayed off the phones. I can tell you that. It seems a more efficient process now. Uh, a lot less of the unknown once the the players. Yeah, everybody's scout. agreed to for the most right. part. So right. So do you ever come up with a situation where that agent, that player, a particular pick, and I'm sure not as often as in past years, where they throw you a curveball and and you kind of go, wait a minute. We, we'd already agreed to this. Well, no, I heard it differently. Is there ever that situation? Uh, yeah, of course there is, but it, it's, it's, it's happening far less. It's right. random. Um, you might even take a player uh, somewhere between five and 10 that you're, you're really attracted to, but you're not getting enough information about his signability truly out there. You know, you could have a kid that says, listen, I'll, I'll sign between five and 10, but if you don't give me $400,000, I'm not signing. And it's up to you to make a gut decision about this guy's going to walk away from 300 uh, to go in the seventh round to go back to college. Eh, I'm not sure about that. Right. So, you know, it's, it's, it's that feel, it's that instinct. And you talk a lot about the character of the player. I would think, um, that if you do have a situation where, where an agent throws you a curveball, uh, now that goes into your evaluation of the character of the agent. And in the future, if you're, if you're double crossed one time, Hey, wait a minute. Now in the future with that agent, you know, he's got to kind of mind his P's and Q's for his reputation alone. Like, no, no, we're not even going to mess with you because of what you did to us last year. Sure. So I guess there's a lot of that going on. Um, all your days, you've, you've signed a ton of guys. Uh, and, and you probably won't be able to pick one. But if you could, who's your who's your most your your proudest sign? I, I know that's a tough question because there's a lot. No, one no. that you I, yeah, go ahead. I can go I can go right to it if you're talking about early in the draft. Mm -hmm. Zito, Barry Zito. Um, I had seen Barry by accident as a junior in high school. I saw him as a senior in high school. I saw him at UC Santa Barbara. I saw him at Pierce Junior College. And I saw him at SC 
and I saw him in the cave. And at no time did I think Barry Zito was a top 10, 15 pick in the first round. Nice pitcher, average heater, pretty good breaker. Where's the command going to be? Where's the changeup going to be? Blah, blah, blah. Uh, this was 98, I'm going to say. Yeah, that sounds and right. And I, I remember being in Richmond, Virginia, and I just left the game, and I stopped at an Apple's Bee and had some chicken wings and a beer. And I'm scratching my head. It's about a month away from the draft. I'm scratching my head of all the guys that I've seen that aren't going to be there when I pick and the guys that are going to be there that some of our scouts or the game of baseball really thinks are going to go in the top 10. And I'm not on them. Not, I just, I can't seek my teeth into them. I've got issues with deliveries. I've got issues with touch and feel. I've got all kinds of things going through my head. So I take out a napkin, the old school napkin trick, and start scratching names. And I look at myself and I said, you know, I've seen all these guys. I haven't seen one guy even come close to out pitching Barry Zito. I got no problems with his arm action. I got no problems with his physical frame. I got no problems with his delivery. His changeup's getting better. Everybody knew his curveball in college turned up, turned into a hammer in the pro game. And I remember in that draft telling Billy, listen, I'm not telling you this guy is an ace. I'm just telling you this guy's coming to the big leagues. He's going to get there fast, and he's going to be part of the or part of the rotation for five, six, maybe seven years. And uh, everybody was good with that. But the bottom line is, you know, the guy wins a Cy Young like an hour after I take him. And I, I'm smarter than I am. You know, I <laughs> turned out smarter than I look. And uh, But it was funny signing him because I tried to cut a deal with his agent because I explained to the agent, listen, let's do something that helps both of us out. If I don't take Barry Zito, I'm going to give you 48 hours to go figure out where Barry's going to go in the draft. And the best he could come up with was like uh, Colorado at – 21. And I said, okay, I'll give you that. Even though Bob Gebhardt, the GM is a big radar gun guy and Barry's out there flipping it at 90. When it all comes down to it, it's going to be a hard call for Colorado to take Barry. So I ended up cutting a deal and that allowed me to sign Gerald Laird, who was a under control player uh, from the year uh, before. And we got both of those players done. On the flip side, still to this day, is there anybody that, that wakes you up at night that got away, you went against your gut, whatever it may be, like, how did I miss that? Oh, God, where does that closet empty out to? <laughs> um, well, I certainly didn't think Barry Bonds would hit 50 bombs a year. How's that? I had him pretty high. He was athletic. I never thought he was a defensive player that everybody said he was going to be extremely hitterish. Uh, for me, I just, it was hard for me to put all this power together in college. Did I think he would hit some homers? Yeah. Did I think he'd end up having the best disciplined eye in baseball with 50 bombs a year? No. I love, I love stuff like this though. Cause you were there, you scouted him in college. So yeah. give me an honest answer, Grady Fuson. If Brett Boone and Grady Fuson are sitting down having dinner, at, we just came back from Arizona State. Now I'm in a time capsule now, but I said, Grady, all right, we're, we're making a decision on Bonds. What do you think, how many home runs is he going to hit at his peak in the big leagues? What would your answer be back then? Back in, back when he was coming out of college, it's yeah. 15 to 20. And, and that's what makes this game so hard. You just never know. Even the guys that have the experience that you have uh, over all, oh, your, yeah. all your years. This It's it's an awesome discussion. Uh, I wish you the best. Have a great uh, draft. Hopefully you get some. You need some help. You need some help right now up in Oakland. I can see that. <laughs> we need some help. And, and for you listening to the Boom Podcast, this is one of my favorite stories. And I don't remember. Grady. 
Grady was uh, assistant general manager, as he mentioned, with the Padres for five years with the uh, Texas Rangers. John Hart was the, was the GM at the time. Tell the Boone podcast the story about Brett Boone's batting practice. I want to hear it again. Oh, my God. Uh, so in Texas, well, obviously the, the, the other ballpark, now they have a new one. Our offices, the baseball department was on the third floor in dead center field. And straight down below my office was the Nolan Ryan playground. So it had all these little uh, rides and things that kids could do before you got, you looked out to the center field wall. So I'm in my office, Seattle's taking BP and something hits the glass in my window. I'm going, what the hell just happened here? Some bird flying to my window or what? And another one hits the window. Well, my assistant who's in the office next door, he always had a pair of binoculars in his, in his office. And I went over there. I said, who's hitting? Is that, he goes, that's Brett Bone. I said, he's hitting balls <laughs> over center field and one hopping our window on the third floor. You got to be kidding me. <laughs> I mean, that had to be 450, 460. Yeah, hard to do BP distance. I love it because Grady told me that story when I came over to Oakland. I didn't remember. I But then when he took me back, I thought, I do remember taking BP on a day in Texas, and that wind was really helping. So balls were flying that day. But I love telling that story. You know, I'm getting older now. I like to toot my horn from time yeah. to time. Grady Fuson, this is awesome. It's been a pleasure having you on. I appreciate the the inside, the intel leading up to the draft. I think the people listening to the Boom Podcast are going to love it. Good luck in the draft. I'll see you soon. Um, and that's all we got for today. For those of you listening to the Boom Podcast, I appreciate you listening, and we'll see you next time. 